So, this is, uh, yeah, this is when he pulls off the road. Uh, he's been now on the road for a while. It's October. And <clears throat> he pulls off somewhere in North Dakota, I think. And he pulls off next to a stream, quite, quite a bit away from the traffic. Feels very secure there. He's nice. He's alone with Charlie. Fixes himself a big dinner. Soaks his feet in the stream. Everything is nice until Charlie raised his head and roared a warning without bothering to get to his feet. Then I heard a motor approaching. And trying to get up, found my feet were long gone in sleep in the cold water. I couldn't feel them at all. While I rubbed and massaged them, and they awakened of painful pins and needles, a ventured sedan pulling a short coupled trailer like a box turtle lumbered down from the road, took a position on the water about 50 yards away. I felt annoyance at this invasion of my privacy, but Charlie was delighted. He moved on stiff legs with little delicate mincing steps to investigate the new newcomer and in the manner of dogs and people did not look directly at the object of his interest. If I seem to be ridiculing Charlie, look you at what I was doing in the next half hour and also what my neighbor was doing. Each of us went about our business with slow deliberateness, each being very careful not to stare at the other and at the same time sneaking glances, appraising, evaluating. I saw a man, not young, not old, with a jaunty springy step. He was dressed in olive drab trousers and a leather jacket. <clears throat> and he wore a cowboy hat, but with a flat crown and the brim curled and held to a peak by the chin strap. He had a classic profile, even in the distance. I could see that he wore a beard. And even in the distance, I see he wore a beard that tied into his sideburns and so found his hair. My own beard is restricted to my chin. The air had grown quickly chill, and I don't know whether my head was cold or that I didn't want to remain uncovered in the presence of a stranger. At any rate, I put on my old naval cap, made a pot of coffee, and sat on my back steps, glancing with great interest at everything except my neighbor who swept out of his trailer and threw out a dishpan of soapy water while he pointedly unwatched me. Charlie's interest was captured and held by various growlings and barkings that came from inside the trailer. There must be in everyone a sense of proper and civil timing, for I just resolved to speak to my neighbor. In fact, I just stood up to move toward him when he strolled toward me, he too had felt that the period of waiting was over. He moved with a strange gait, reminiscent to me of something I couldn't place. There was a seedy grandeur about the man. In the time of chivalric myth, this would be the beggar who turns out to be a king's son. As he came near, I stood up from my iron back stoop to greet him. He did not give me a sweeping bow, but I had the impression that he might have. Either that or a full regimental salute. Good afternoon, he said. I see you of the profession. I guess my mouth fell open. It's years since I've heard the term. Well, no, no, I'm not. Now it was his turn to look puzzled. Not? But my dear chap, if you're not, how do you know the expression? Well, I guess I've been on the fringes. Ah, oh, fringes, of course. Backstage, no doubt. Direction, stage manager, flops, I said. Would you like a cup of coffee? Delighted. He would never let down. That's one th nice thing about those of the profession. They rarely do. He folded himself on the divan seat behind my table with a grace I never achieved in all my traveling. And I set out two plastic mugs and two glasses, poured coffee, set a bottle of whiskey within e easy reach. It seemed to me a mist of tears came into his eyes, but it might be that they were in mine. Flops, he said. Who hasn't known them hasn't played. <laughs> Shall I pour for you? 
please to do. No, no, no water. He cleared his palate with black coffee and then munched delicately on the whiskey while his eyes swept my abode. Nice place you have here, very nice. Tell me, uh, please, what made you think I was uh, in the profession? He chuckled dryly. Oh, very simple, Watson. You know, I played that. <laughs> Both parts. <laughs> Well, first I saw your poodle, and then I observed your beard. And then I observed, and then on approaching, I saw that you wore a naval cap with the British royal arms. Uh -huh. Was that what broadened your A's? Well, that might be, old chap. That certainly might be. I fall into such things, hardly knowing I'm doing it. Now close up, I saw that he was not young. His movements were pure youth, but there was about his skin texture and the edges of his lips that was middle-aged or past it, and his eyes, large, warm, brown irises set on whites that were turning yellow, corroborated this. Your health, I said. We emptied our plastic glasses, chased with coffee, and I refilled. Uh, if it isn't too personal or too painful, uh, what did you do in the theater? Oh, that's that's the guy, the player. If it isn't too personal, too painful, what did you do in the theater? <laughs> I wrote a couple of plays. Produced? Yeah, they flopped. Would I know your name? I doubt it, nobody else did. He sighed, oh, it's a hard business. But if you're hooked, you're hooked. I was hooked by my granddaddy and my daddy set the hook. Both actors and my mother and grandmother. Lord, that is show business. Are you uh, uh, resting now? Not at all. I'm playing. What, for God's sake? Where? Wherever I could trap an audience, schools, churches, service clubs, I bring culture give readings. I guess you can hear my partner over there complaining. He's very good too, part Airedale, part Coyote. <laughs> Steals the show when he feels like it. I began to feel delighted with this man. Uh, I didn't know such things went on. They don't some of the time. You've been at it long? Three years, less two months. All over the country? Wherever two or three are gathered together, I hadn't worked for over a year. Just tramped the agencies, casting calls, living on my benefits. With me, there's no question of doing something else. It's all I know. All I've ever known. Once long ago, there was a community of theater people on Nantucket Island. My daddy bought a nice lot there, put up a frame house. Well, I sold that, bought my outfit there, and I've been moving ever since, and I like it. I don't think I'll ever go back to the grind. Of course, if there should be a part. <laughs> but hell, who'd remember me for a part? Any part. You're striking close to home there. Yes, it's a hard business. I hope you won't think I'm inquisitive, uh, even if I am, but... I'd like to know how you go about it. What happens? How do people treat you? Oh, they treat me very well, and I don't know how I go about it. Sometimes I even have to rent a hall and advertise. Sometimes I speak to the principal of the high school. But aren't, aren't people uh, scared of gypsies, vagabonds, and, and actors? No, I guess they are at first. At the beginning, they take me for a kind of harmless freak. But I'm honest, and I don't charge much, and after a little, uh, the material takes over, and it gets into them. You see, I respect the material. That makes a difference. I'm not a charlatan, I'm an actor. Good or bad, an actor. His color had deepened with whiskey and vehemence, and perhaps at being able to talk with someone with a little lightness of experience. I poured more into his glass this time, Watch with pleasure his enjoyment of it. He drank and sighed. 
who don't get something like this very often. I hope I haven't given you the impression that I'm rolling in receipts. Sometimes it's a little rough. Go on about it. Tell more. Where was I? You were saying you respected your material and that you were an actor. Oh, yes. Well, there's one more thing. You know, when, when show people come into what they call the sticks, they have a contempt for the yokels. It took me a little time, but when I learned that there aren't any yokels, I began to get on fine. I learned respect for my audience. They feel that, and they work with me, and not against me. Once you respect them, they can understand anything you can tell them. Well, tell about your material. What, what do you use? He looked down at his hands, and I saw that they were well-kept, very white, as though he wore gloves most of the time. I hope you won't think I'm stealing material, he said. I admire the delivery of Sir John Gielgud. I heard him do his monologue of Shakespeare, The Ages of Man, and then I bought a record of it to study what he could do with words, with tones and inflections. You use that? Yes, but I, I don't steal it. I tell about hearing Sir John and what it did to me, and then I say I'm going to try and give an impression of how he did it. Clever. Well, it does help because he gives authority to the performance. And Shakespeare doesn't need billing. And that way I'm not stealing his material. It's like I'm celebrating it, which I do. How do they respond? Well, I guess I'm pretty much at home with it now because I can watch the words sink in and they forget about me and their eyes kind of turn inward and I'm not a freak to them anymore. But what do you think? Well, I think Gielgud would be pleased. Oh, I wrote to him. I told him what I was doing, how I was doing it, a long letter. And he brought a lumpy wallet from his hip pocket and extracted a carefully folded piece of aluminum foil, opened it, and with careful fingers unfolded a small sheet of note paper with a name engraved at the top. The message was typed, it said, Dear, thank you for your kind and interesting letter. I would not be an actor if I were not aware of the sincere flattery implied in your work. Good luck and God bless you, John Gielgud. I sighed and I watched his reverent fingers fold the note, close it in its armor of foil and put it away. I never show that to anyone to get a show he said. I wouldn't think of doing that. And I'm sure he wouldn't. He whirled his plastic glass in his hand and regarded the whiskey left in it, a gesture often designed to draw emptiness to the attention of a host. I uncorked the bottle. No, he said, no more for me. I learned long ago that the most important and valuable of acting techniques is the exit. <laughs> but I, I'd like to ask more questions. All the more reason for the exit. <laughs> he drained the last drop. Keep them asking, he said. An exit clean and sharp. Thank you and good afternoon. I watched him swing lightly toward his trailer. And I knew I would be haunted by one question. I called out, well, wait a moment. He paused, turned back to me. What does a dog do? Oh, a couple of silly tricks. He keeps the performance simple. He picks it up when it goes stale. And he continued on to his home. So it went on. A profession older than writing and one that will probably survive when the written word has disappeared. And all the sterile wonders of movies and television and radio will fail to wipe it out. A living man in communication with a living audience. But how did he live? Who were his companions? What was his hidden life? He was right. His exit whetted the questions. <laughs>